We are the Grace One Guild. We are proceeding through onto our 10th segment of 2023's version of the book festival, a celebration of innovations and ideas, illumination, excitement, and other words that start with the letter I. We've been going through a broad spectrum of fiction, nonfiction, uh, new ideas, philosophy, strategy, tactics, a little bit of AI, a lot of AI. We There's a technology thread through this uh, version, and that's part of the reason why we have our next author, Rod Chass, out of the wondrous province of Alberta, uh, placed right now taking a little bit of a break in Hawaii, but is taking a break from his break to come share some of his ideas in a book that he and some fellows wrote a while back, Phantom X Machina. And uh, I know that good books, just like past and history, good books echo and good books rhyme. And uh, Rod, why don't I hand it over to you? Give yourself uh, some time to introduce yourself. And um, we're speaking to the guild and we're talking about your futures that you've written and what you've planned for the future. Thanks, Rod. Welcome. Yeah, thanks, Rob. And thank you to yourself and Sean for allowing us to present the book. So a little bit about myself. So I'm a technology professional by trade. I've held numerous uh, executive roles in companies and also founder of several startups, one of which was actually based on a lot of the principles I'll talk about today. And almost had a home run with that one, almost a seven-figure exit pre-revenue, but that's a story for beers and another day. So just let me share. And then I'll walk everybody through a bit of a story. Sorry, it's the first time using Zoom on my Mac, so it doesn't have permissions. Give me a second. No worries. Denise was telling us this morning that we saved some snow for you when you get back home. She's down in Calgary, though. Oh, is she? Okay. So yeah, my more kids snow. Are <laughs> I think it snowed, like, because I stepped out for about three hours there. It probably snowed almost 20 centimeters since this morning. So, anyways, even the snow conditions haven't helped. But, yeah, it's here when you get back from Hawaii, Rod. Well, actually, Edmonton's not getting that storm. I checked the weather. Ah, okay. No. But it rained last night. <laughs> yeah. Great. So, like yeah. Sorry. So thank you for allowing me to present. So what I'll talk about is, as Rob mentioned, we wrote a book. Uh, believe it or not, it was actually in 2016. And so I pulled out a slide deck that we used to use uh, right after the book came out to dust it off a bit, updated it based on where we are today. And Interestingly enough, to Rob's point, the principles actually still hold true today, which is really interesting. So I'll take you on a bit of a story of how we ended up writing this book. So myself, uh, Anshman, who's an MBA professor at the University of Athabasca in Alberta, and Brian, who is the ex-CIO of the University of Alberta. The three of us had written a couple papers on VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And we wrote these papers in particular focused on higher ed. And so we had just finished uh, writing an article for the book that you see there. So it was 2013. And the three of us used to get together every Sunday morning for coffee. And Blockbuster had just gone bankrupt. So I threw an idea on the table to the two of them and said, something's happening, but I can't sort of connect the dots. And in particular, digital is taking on a new role. And so Anshman being the academic of the three of us said, well, let's explore it. And that's what led to Phantom Ex Machina. So it's Latin for ghost of the machines. And what we started to look at was what is digital's impact on business models? And that's the story I'll talk about today. So the three of us started this in early 2014 and the book came out in 2016. So I read probably two dozen books on digital transformation every Gartner and Forrester paper I could get at my hands on. I was a subscriber at the time to vote. So read almost everything I could get my hands on. And what we ultimately were able to sort of uncover was there was this 
thing happening. We we're all on this journey, but we didn't understand why and what was happening. And so the key is, as we used to joke, we could feel it, we could sense it. We realized something big was happening, but we just couldn't, like I said, connect the dots. And back in 2014, you have to remember, so mobile phones were still fairly new. The internet was maturing. So there was a lot of things sort of floating out there, but it was hard to see how all this was connected. And the key thing that we were uncovering as we were talking every Sunday morning, like I said, is the traditional rules of business weren't applying anymore. And I'll walk you through what that means. And back then, 2014, uh, we, we joked it was the dawn of a digital business revolution. We now see those effects in 2023. And the thing that was happening too was the pace of technical and business change was at a pace that we hadn't seen. And I've got a graph coming up to show this. And I kept this graph in and we'll talk about it in a second. But so we were really focused on the who, the why, when, what, and where to figure out like what is happening. And that's really what led to our book. So we co-authored two chapters, worked with the other authors uh, to influence their chapters based on the model that I'll present. It was designed for the C-suite and it really looked at business operations and the influence technology had. And so we didn't focus on what, we focused on what was happening rather than how to fix it. So you have to remember 2014 came out in 2016. There was all these data points, but we didn't necessarily know it. Now there's a lot of solutions to some of the things that have happened, but this is what we ultimately stumbled upon. So you can see this chart we borrowed from Harvard Business Review in the early 1900s, it shows the proliferation of the tech. So you'll see some things like this dotted line here, which is electricity, took 50 years. And as you get into the early 90s, cell phone took a decade plus. And then Pokemon Go came out and it took 13 hours and it hit top of the app chart on uh, Google. And this is one of the things that makes me laugh because everybody focuses on ChatGPT, but everybody forgets about Pokemon Go. It still beat ChatGPT. But it did all of that without any money spent on advertising, and it was a global app. And then innovation was happening sort of in broad categories. So from the 1900s again, age of manufacturing, 1960, the age of dis distribution, 1990s, the age of information. In the 2020 or 2010, sorry, was the age of the customer. And now this is a Forster paper that I borrowed this graph from. Obviously, now we're in the era of automation and AI. So what we ultimately uncovered was what we call a two-order disruption model. So the first order is when digitization of a product or service provides enhanced value, lowers the costs of operating, and then it has a broad base. And then what we call the second order is when the business model of a particular good or service is destabilized and a new business model is emerging. And so I've got some examples of this. So as I mentioned at our coffee chat, it started with Netflix overtaking or the perception of overtaking Blockbuster. So we did a ton of research on Netflix and Blockbuster. So Blockbuster at the time was a billion dollar organization, global, primarily based in North America, a billion dollars in revenue. And most people don't remember, but Netflix actually started out as a DVD mail order service company. And obviously Blockbuster was brick and mortar, traditional DVD. And then obviously Netflix evolved into a streaming video distributor and then Blockbuster ultimately bankrupt. So in the first order, the what Netflix did is their value proposition as a mail order DVD company was you can request a video, they'll deliver it to you the next day, and they won't charge you. Yeah. Mm, and so the, oh, hang on. So the, the, the you able to find them, Rob? Yep. Perfect, thank you. So thank the you. learning from this first component here was a startup enters an industry as an outsider and they take on the industry incumbents. But one of the things that they've done 
is they've done deep analysis on the industry and looked for the weaknesses of that industry and they exploit it. So for Blockbuster, late fees were huge profit and loss line item and they made millions from it. So they didn't want to get rid of it. But Blockbuster, that was their initial value proposition was return the DVD when you want. The key thing is, is the incumbent in the industry or incumbents like I said, on their profit and loss sheet is a bunch of revenue related to that new sort of value proposition. So they, in this case, Blockbuster kicked off a committee. It took them about 10 months from the time that Netflix popped up as mail order. And obviously the committee was groupthink and they came back with a couple of recommendations. But the key thing is they weren't willing to harvest any of the revenue. What we also uncovered as an outsider comes into an industry, the first initial reaction committee, second reaction is a legal or regulatory play. And I'll pull all this together soon about opening high. So that was one of the recommendations is, does Blockbuster have any legal options? Well, the thing that they didn't understand about Netflix, well-funded BC back. And Netflix in this case, had anticipated lawsuits and any sort of regulatory squabbles. But the ultimate thing I put in the bottom there is the tech is the genie out of the lantern. And I'll, I'll pull that back on why that's important. So next thing is the industry incumbents are still ignoring this young scrappy startup. But the thing that's happened is that value proposition becomes a hit with consumers or the buyers or users. And it's ultimately setting a new industry bar without the incumbent fully understanding. It. And so what this does is it leads to incumbents start to see some of their market share, some of their revenue drop. And the incumbents view the scrappy young startup as a one trick pony. Well, they're just doing mail order DVD, how dangerous can it be? But as a young scrappy startup, and all the ones that we profiled. So we looked at Airbnb, Netflix, Uber, and a few others. They all had detailed product roadmaps. So their initial product was not their end product. So then ultimately what happened, Blockbuster went bankrupt. On Netflix's long-term roadmap, they had producing their own content. So up until this point, Netflix had built the platform to distribute other firm's content. Now what they've done is they've come out and said, okay, well, we're going to produce our own content because we have the platform. And so what they've ultimately done is they've taken out an incumbent in one industry, but now they're taking on incumbents in secondary industries. In this case, the movie studios, who they're actually serving. And many of the movie studios realized this after it was too late and were like, oh no. But then they also disrupted other uh, industries, cable companies. So cable companies also had a platform to distribute uh, content, obviously filled with ads. Their secondary value proposition was they were ad free. And then I used uh, obviously ChatGPT yesterday to create this little image. These secondary industries that are disrupted, they saw what happened to the first industry. So they're like, okay, well, we can compete. So let's do it. So I use an example of uh, Canada. Several Canadian companies, cable companies got together and created a, an offering called Show Me. So they felt they had the content, they had the distribution, and they had the industry partners. So they had all the right dynamics. So what they did is they copycatted Netflix's initial offering without the value proposition. The tech was much less, it was a cobbled together mess. Screen resolution was half of what Netflix was offering. And ultimately what happened is Show Me there was three cable companies, three, I think, might have been two, I don't quite remember, but it was multi-million dollar loss for both the cable companies. So because they didn't understand that initial value proposition and that a new industry bar has been set, copycatting doesn't work. So some other key learnings that we learned through all of this is these young, scrappy, agile startups, they're all about scale and digital first. So it's all about that economies of scale. So for those of you who are familiar with the long tail, this is a long tail play. So they move fast, 
They also have the motto, but they'll never talk about it, is they take no industry prisoners. They're, they're using a platform business model. And at the end of the day, they're all data companies. And so why that's important, some of them have used data as their secret sauce. Initially, when a lot of these young tech startups started, the VCs knew that the runway to before they made money was quite long, so they were funded for a while. But they've come in and they've disrupted industries. As mentioned, we also looked at Airbnb. So again, platform business model, Airbnb, back when it started, did not actually own any real estate. All they did is they provided a platform for people to use their own real estate, connect somebody with real estate with a potential guest. So that was the first order for Airbnb. Second order was Airbnb started to team up and provide multiple services. One of the things that they offered was called trips. So it was a full experience. They partnered with airlines, they partnered with adventure companies. And so what the secondary effect on this was, first order is they took on hotels, second order is now they're, they're impacting travel agents and uh, adventure guides. We also looked at Uber. So the value proposition for Uber, so I see some people with some gray hair, which is good because all of us remember calling a cab and the cab company saying, yeah, the cab will arrive in the next one to three hours. So the Achilles heel for the cab companies were very bureaucratic and there was no certainty on when it would arrive. And we're all busy people and we don't like sitting around for a cab. So Uber took that on and said, we'll give you a little map. We'll show you a bunch of cars, pick one, and we'll actually tell you when it's going to arrive. So again, they went after the Achilles heel of the industry. In Uber's particular case, they also took on huge regulatory requirements because cab companies in every major metropolitan city had regularly regulatory requirements for keeping anybody with a car out of their industry. So that's the model really quick. Uh, but what made all this possible? So again, remember this is 2014 to 2016. It was really around, we had access to digital tools that we didn't have before. So we had people plus infrastructure, which really equated to disruption. But it was disruption at a scale that was never seen before. And so I quote this from a book. This was one of the first books I ever found on digital disruption. It was from James McCreevy from Forrester. So Forrester was on this quite quickly. But ultimately what really led to all this stuff was these four, sorry, five components. Open source technology. So the cloud as we know it would never exist if it wasn't for open source. So open source led to the creation of the cloud, which is allowing people to access critical technology at a scale and cost that they would have never achieved. We're also in the era where mobile devices, any device, anywhere were possible. We had the advent of social media or connections, and we had tooling to allow us to start to data mine large volumes of data in ways that we've never had to. So what all of this did is it removed the barriers to entry and it leveled the playing field. So no longer were these technologies the thing of only the Fortune 500. It basically democratized who could start to do things. The other thing that happened, and again, I borrowed this from Forrester, old disruption was there was a handful of disruptors or innovators. It cost a fair amount to get into the game and they were able to produce so much in terms of ideas or innovation. But with those five components, as Forrester quoted here back in 2011, was in 10x the innovation, at a tenth the cost, and 100x the power. I'd love to see this chart updated based on the events of the last year, because it's probably multiple zeros after the power and it's a fraction of the cost. So basically through all of this, the one thing that we did see is the new business commodity was value, speed to value. So if you think about a lot of corporations, there's a lot of boxes to check before you can innovate. And these scrappy young startups bypassed all of that. And one of the things we were hearing when we published the book was, yeah, but that doesn't matter. My industry is unique. We heard that a lot. 
So we found this chart from HBR. So you'll see the day 2016. And it was a survey of CEOs in terms of what industries felt they were going to be disrupted in the next 24 months. So it may not happen in the last eight years, but media in the last year is the rules of media are fundamentally being rewritten because of generative economy. Telecoms, similarly so. Financial services, seeing a big change with fintech and now with generative AI. Retail, the rules of the game in retail almost don't apply compared to where they were a decade ago. If we look at insurance, similarly, healthcare. So all of these industries have fundamentally changed due to, to digital. And another stat that we had pulled together back from 2016 is, uh, as the title there is, do you think I'm making this stuff up? So 80% of companies that existed before 1980 no longer exist. And the reason for that is mergers and acquisitions. So in the first order, one of the things that happens is industry incumbents, as they start to lose market share, one of the things they start to do is buy the competitors to maintain some of that market share. And then as you see, companies listed before 1970 had a 92% chance of surviving, but between 2000 and 2009, only a 63% chance. I couldn't find the most current stats on this, but I do know that the survival of firms, sorry, I've got a cold air, I'm gonna drink again. The survival of firms, I think is getting shorter. Another thing that's happened is those scrappy young startups, as I mentioned earlier, they're data driven. And so this little Forrester chart here, what it's showing is companies that are data driven are outperforming their competitors. And this was from, uh, I think this was from 2016 as well, by 27% annual growth versus their competitors. The one thing we also bumped into, and I've seen this in my professional work, is it's what I call the digital divide. Most executives in established industry businesses, well-established industry businesses, don't understand digital. They don't understand tech and they're feel fearful of it. And that also leads to part of what is their Achilles heel. Because they don't understand tech, they're not willing to invest in it. And they're not willing to invest in a full business model, tra business model transformation. So, as mentioned, first order is the scrappy, come, or scrappy outsider comes in, changes the rules of the game, but the incumbent isn't willing to look at their business model and go, where are we susceptible? How do we need to change this? They have all these line items. People have budgets. People have revenue targets. They aren't willing to really rethink that. Part of it is the problem is at the C-suite. But this is a great McKinsey chart here showing those companies that have adopted digital, and again, you know, see the date, 2014 to 15, the established leaders are outperforming everybody else. And that gap for me is getting wider and wider. And as a tech professional, one thing that concerns me is also as a Canadian, that gap is getting bigger and bigger in the last 12 months. There's a great quote from Jeff Immelt at the time, the chief executive of GE. So GE, global organization in the Fortune 100. And he wasn't afraid of one of their big competitors popping up. Through these economies of scale, what he was ultimately afraid of was a couple guys, girls in garage coming up with an idea and taking out a whole business unit. And we've seen that in other instances. And I've touched on this a few times, but at the center of all this transformation is data and using that data for insights to drive action. So most scrappy young startups, this is one of the key things that come, that's come out of Silicon Valley, is it's all about metrics, measuring key things, and then starting to action on them when things are going left to right, or center, and making business decisions. Sorry, I see there's a couple of questions. Just let me, looks like it's from the last section. You're good. Okay. So I'll connect the dots on today. Because one of the things I've been observing over the last 12 months, and it's literally 12 months that ChatGPT has come out, 12 months this week, 
is what does all this mean? Is this model still valid? So chat GPT or open AI disrupted industries with new value, check mark. They disrupted everything from big tech, Google, Facebook, to other knowledge-based businesses and everything in between. So open AI has done it on a scale that has been unheralded to date. The other thing is most businesses, industry incumbents aren't paying attention. Yeah, this thing doesn't apply to my industry. How am I gonna use a, a bot? Some of the disruptors are copycatty. So one of the things when I first, I bumped into GPT probably about 16 months ago and my head exploded with all the possibilities it could happen. I actually went out and bought the domain storyengine.ai and I was gonna build a story engine where you could type in a component and it would build a story. For you. And as we started to work on our pitch deck, we found a business partner, we paused because I, the spidey senses on the back of my, the little hairs in the back of my neck started to go off and I was like, I think we're at risk if we do this. So we paused. And then GPT came out a couple months later and I'm thankful we did because I've watched all of these young startups pop in but leveraged OpenAI's API and she basically copycatted and now GPT or OpenAI, sorry, is taking them on. The next thing we're seeing is established businesses are seeking lawsuits and regulatory. So this is a session of authors. I feel for all of us because our work is now public domain and we're not getting paid. So many are seeking lawsuits, but the key is the genie's out of the picture. Establishes businesses are seeing revenue decline. So if we pick on marketing, I'm seeing little articles all over the place of search engine optimization experts complaining that their their businesses are now falling apart. Uh, traditional marketing agencies, similarly. If we look at a two-order model, two model with opening, right? services are being destabilized and new business models emerge. This is happening every day. So it was probably maybe a month ago, OpenAI released GPTs, build your own. And build your own by just typing in a bunch of natural language into the little box and upload some data. The, to me, that is where the future of massive disruption is going to happen with what OpenAI is doing. And then, as I've already talked on, the second order is, and this is a new dimension to what we covered with our book, OpenAI is clobbering their own business partners. It's the no holds barred approach of, yeah, you can use our stuff, but hey, we might also compete with you one day. So OpenAI is a fascinating case study. I'm bugging Brian and Anchman that I think we need to dust off the book and see how relevant what we looked at almost a decade ago is to today and what really is sitting out there in the future. The one thing that scares me, and I've been sitting on the sidelines because the pace of innovation is so fast that I can't keep up. So Rob and I have this debate through LinkedIn all the time of sharing fabulous articles. And my head explodes each day going, uh, I can't even process all of these things going, this innovation is everywhere. Like, where do you even play in it? The key thing with OpenAI is they're disrupting hundreds of industries simultaneously, including big tech. Like Google was caught off guard. Like that, to me, says it all right there. And so, yes, Google's catching up. Google had all the components. They just didn't exercise it because they didn't want to harvest their core revenue. So for me, like I said, I dusted this deck off, added in the OpenAI stuff. It's still the most fascinating and exciting of times, but it's also the most uncertain times. And so for those of you who are on the call, I encourage all of you to take some of the learnings from this deck and uh, start having some conversations. So with that, that's the end of it. So welcome questions. So I saw there were some questions. Yeah, uh, there's a couple in there. Uh, Doyle had uh, mentioned something and uh, I'll bring it in. I know that uh, the work that we've been doing is actually work. I think the we're doing 2023 style research in real time and it's fast, right? But if we think about this, if we do two or three things a day each, that's four or six things across 52 weeks. The research is done. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's gone up, nothing, uh, and then up and down, right? Negative and positive, good, bad, and ugly is going on. And it, it's super rapid, it's been fascinating. Uh, and in uh, the work that people are doing in research, I think that uh, the speech should continue. 
But uh, really good work here. And I'm glad you took a chance to look to the past to see where the future is going. And uh, it's part of, uh, certainly part of sense making, part of what the guild is made of, is that some people think that looking out to the future, doing predictions means you don't look to the past. You just stand on your feet and you look forward and say, well, that's going to happen. And um, I don't find that realistic at all. So when you're thinking about next projects, uh, are there a couple of goalposts you're looking at that are more favorable than not in the, in the way of what other people are doing in building businesses or, or investing or innovating? Or where are you centered on investment and innovation now that we're sort of a year into this next stage of uh, AI and uh, digital, if you will? So it's a good question, Rob. So I keep joking with my wife that I'm actually driving myself crazy because I have all these ideas. The tech no longer is a barrier. Like with all of the tech, whether it's the generative AI stuff or other, other traditional type of technology is no longer the barrier. The struggle I'm having is I want to play in the second order and I want to start there and just leapfrog the first order. So I have a couple ideas, but I've been off looking for a couple industry subject matter experts and I'm open to the industry. So I've been out just having conversations with people because like I said, I want to leapfrog stage one and I want to go right to two because we're now seeing that it's possible. So I don't have the direct answer yet. I'm still sort of exploring. And that's also where, like I said, is every day I wake up, read my blogs for two hours and then I'm like, oh my God, how do I process today versus yesterday? So it's been a bit of that, but I welcome if anybody on this call wants to have conversations with me, let's chat. So I can pop into the questions in the chat. Did Blockbuster's unlimited rental video plan make any change? So no, we didn't see that it made a change for Blockbuster. And it was primarily because, again, they were copycatting. And what we've observed is any industry we looked at, copycatting doesn't work. And the reason for it is the young scrappy startup also has a shiny new face that everybody likes. And that's one of the things the incumbent has against them is they're not shiny because they're, well, you're old. We want the new shiny object. So that's one of the things we saw. So no, it, Blockbuster unfortunately didn't make any impact in combating that. Case. Their biggest Achilles heel was all the, the contracts they had on bricks and mortar buildings. That was the ultimate thing that just couldn't pivot versus Netflix didn't have that, that legacy. Uh, how many companies make it past five years? So as mentioned, uh, Doyle, I looked for stats. I couldn't find them last night, so I apologize. I don't have the answer to that. Uh, given the short lifespan of companies, that's why banks are always trying to visit the client stuff. Yeah. Stuff like that is not unbalanced. I totally agree. I look at, I have a success mentor in my life, and he did a 2024 predictions video yesterday. And he's been playing a lot with generative AI. So his whole thing is success mentor. So he sells courses and training and one-on-one. -on -one. And in his prediction video for next year, he said, right off your business model, it is there is one thing now that's going to keep you in business, and that's relationships. People do business with people. That's never going to change. The, the bots, the tech will be there just to help connect us, schedule our meetings, that kind of stuff. And when he said that, I was like, he's actually true. That is... At least in the short term, for possibly the next decade, we're still going to do business. With people. But I do have a book in my reading list from Gartner. It's, uh, I don't remember the exact title, but it's When Machines Do Business with Machines. I think that's what it's called. I haven't read it yet. But that's one of the things Gartner's predicting is machines are soon going to start talking to machines. I would argue generative AI is already starting that. And soon we will just be there to observe and get reports of, oh, yeah, there were 17 conversations. A billion dollars was traded today. Uh, as much as unlocking the data, what about scrutinizing data? Is the poisoning doctrine data still a threat? So one of the things, to the back to my point about data, is these young scrappy startups are collecting data. And a lot of the data they're actually using to measure their success is not data that they're getting the customer to enter, it's what they collect about their customers. So think about Netflix, the recommendation. So you look at four different movies, but you only watch one of them. They've tracked that you've looked at those four movies. So it's them collecting the data. So the data is very clean. 
It doesn't have the the badness of having a customer enter stuff. So that's one of the differences. And then final, uh, a lot of businesses are up in the puff as well as students open their eyes. Yeah, the, the key thing that I find staggering is the pace of innovation from OpenAI. Like I said, is I wake up because I'm in the Mountain Standard Time Zone. Rob usually pops up in my LinkedIn feed first thing in the morning because he's in Eastern. Oh. So I get to see get to see some of the things he's read. And it's usually a lot of stories about OpenAI and they've added this, they've done this. So hopefully that answers all those questions. Welcome more. Uh, Rod, it was it was an awesome presentation, research, collaboration, expertise, everything rolled into one. So thank you very much. Uh, if I may ask you, could you go to the slide where you were mentioning that something is happening where you had several sentences? Because I come also sure. from the same schools. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, to explain that, uh, I delivered a lecture a few years ago on uh, developing a strategic intuition. So is it just strategic intuition or is there more to the recipe well, that's <laughs> from the expert? Yeah, we didn't, I'll be honest, we didn't drill into that too much. I added it to a slide because it was relevant. That's how Brian Entman and I were feeling. But we didn't really look at that too deeply. So just let me go to that slide. Okay. This one? Yes, sir. I mean, I could practically <laughs> worship to that slide. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like the, the, the reason we, or I wrote that slide is, like I said, is Brian and I, Brian Antman and I, we met for almost a year. And each of us would bring new things to the table every Sunday. And it was really hard to connect the dots. It was just all of this information. So that's what we started talking about. Like there's this emotional aspect to it. And if you look at generative AI in the last year too, I'm a tech professional. I'll admit there's some days I wake up, read the news, and I'm, I get a little anxious going, holy crap, what does this mean to me? Like part of my consulting business could evaporate tomorrow because of these tools. So there's a lot of deep emotion related to how all this tech is transpiring and changing our lives. Thank you. Rod, I'm the genie of the lamp. <laughs> you know everything you know right now. You get a do-over. I'm transporting you back to December 9th, 2022. That's a do-over. What would you do differently now in the cross the last 12 months, knowing that you know what you know and no, no investing in stocks, that doesn't count. <laughs> so as mentioned, I've started three startups. My second startup was really based. So I was building that startup at the same time as we write in the book. And there were some key things that we did in that startup that I'm trying to reproduce. I tried to do it in my third startup. Unfortunately, we picked too hard of a business problem. But where I'm going with this is I partnered up with an industry expert. We digitized their knowledge. And then I came in with the creative lens and put a digital first platform model on it and then launch it to the market. So what would I do differently? I would kick off an incubator, partner up with multiple industry experts and do exactly that secret sauce. Digitize the knowledge of a key industry subject matter expert, put a platform business model on it and go. That's what I would do differently. And it's all about automation. Like I look at, so you and I've talked about this a few times, Rob. So right now I'm consulting to a major Canadian bank and I'm on the inside and I'm blown away at all the craziness and how hard it is to get simple things. Like, so managing a $8 million program for them. My financials come in like seven different little tidbits of information. I have to consolidate it all and have to do this weekly. And I'm like, you're a bank. So my point is, is, Almost every industry has those types of inefficiencies. And it's that twist on what is the value proposition related to their weakness. And it's just go explore. So yeah. that's what I do differently. Yeah. But I'd also say I'm trying to do that right now. Yeah, I'm, like I'm I said, I just haven't found yeah, the right business problem. Rod, it's a trick question. This, I, I yeah. just asked you for your 2024 
advice to a business in uh, in technology. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's good. That's good. Uh, let's switch gears a bit. Uh, heroes and villains. Heroes and villains of 2023. Heroes, villains. Who are they? So for me, I'm going to go to the analogy, the, ge the genies out of the lantern. The villains to me are OpenAI and Microsoft. Okay. And the reason I say that is the moment money got involved in the events of three weeks ago where Sam was fired from OpenAI, everything governance, corporate governance, ethics out the window, and it was all about the investment Microsoft made for $10 billion in OpenAI. And why I say that's a, they're villains is because I think it's virtually impossible now for the governments around the world to implement proper ethics around all these AI models that are popping up. Governments did a really poor job on social media. And I think based on the events of three weeks ago, I don't think they're going to be able to put the genie in the bottle. I think it's gone. And I'm a huge Microsoft advocate. A lot of my consulting is with Microsoft products. But when I watched all of that, I was sitting there going, okay, using what I learned when we wrote the book, big tech just steamrolled everybody in the globe and didn't care. And so that's why I'm saying villains, um, heroes. I don't know if I have a hero right now, actually. You gotta have a hero, man. You gotta have a hero. Um, I can't name one off the top of my head, honestly. I have lots of people I follow, a lot of people I admire, but I haven't seen anybody who I look at and go, oh, got to be following in their footsteps. I haven't seen that. I think part of it is we're all just trying to figure this out. Does this song, at a flash dance, we need a hero? Like, <laughs> yeah. That's, it, that's an assignment for you. Yeah, I'll, I'll dig into it. Sean, what do you got? You got a hero? You got a villain? Saving his beers. Oh, you got him off guard. No, I couldn't. I couldn't. Uh... Are you guys hearing me? Yep. Yep. I, I hope you are. Yep. Um, here is I like your open AI. I, I, I was I was appalled at how many people love the fact that sam altman gave his board like the uh the middle finger and uh and traipsed over uh what i think their job was supposed to be at that company i I don't have the inside goods on what went down but i am very conflicted by that soul but every two years we get a young person out of silicon valley that has way too much overreach uh uh i cite we work i cite uh yep. some crypto crypto ceos and Never. I worry, I guess I'll state this as a question as opposed to, a, I feel like I'm at a university lecture where I just go on for three minutes about my own <laughs> observations on life. I want to ask the expert here. Um, two things I find extraordinarily disconcerting about uh, the world and how we invent new things right now. I'm curious on uh, how your views may have changed even since the last time you wrote this book. One the chase for valuation and the fact that the the thing that's really cool and interesting and valuable to all of us is maybe not the thing that gets invested. Uh, I'm curious if those that algorithm has changed at all. And you mentioned Canada. You know, we live in a country that once every 10 years, we have this great big company that comes up and then melts away because somehow we just don't know how to manage it in this tech world. BlackBerry you know, um, you know, before that, you know, name, name your, name your poison, but it seems like every decade we have a big one that melts. Um, any thoughts in terms of Shopify and where its future goes in terms of what your learnings were in your original book? Yeah, sure. So I'll start with the first question. So in terms of valuations, so as mentioned, I bought that domain storyengine.ai and I wanted to get into the generative AI space and I sat back and was on the sidelines. And then I watched all of these generative AI startups pop up last November, well, October, November, December, and their valuations were out of the, just sky high. And I read an article uh, two days ago. I was going to post it because I'm va on vacation. I was lazy. But what's happening now is a lot of those startups are barn fire sales. And so what I was going to post is, hey, if you're an industry incumbent, 
go buy some of those firms because you're going to get them in a dime for on the dollar. So I think valuations are starting to course correct. One of the things I'm also a, on the board of Alberta Innovates. If you're not familiar with Alberta Innovates, it's a, a crown corporation in Alberta to fund the Alberta innovation ecosystem. And we had a presentation three weeks ago on startup valuations in Canada. And one of the things they're saying and, you know, that the experts that came and talked to us was all the VCs are doing course corrections on valuations. They realized they went crazy and basically writing blank checks and they've they're now course correcting and bringing all those companies back to reality. Uh, can you remind me what your second question was? Oh, Canadian firms. So again, this is me putting on my Alberta Innovates board hat. And I occasionally post about this on LinkedIn. Canadian companies are risk adverse and don't invest in tech and R&D properly. So I think in the G20, we're the lowest of uh, corporate R&D spend. So I worry about Canadian tech innovation. I don't think it's going to happen anymore. Like I look at, so when I was doing my third startup, we partnered with the U of A and for those of University of Alberta, if you're not familiar, uh, this would have been six years ago. The University of Alberta at the time was the third best AI research facility in the globe. And it's just across the river from where I live. And so in my startup, we partnered up with the U of A. I had eight master's students and one PhD student working with me. So I had talent beyond talent. And then the struggle I had is we were pioneering tech that was beyond crazy. And we couldn't get BC money because we were a combination of hardware and software and everybody in the BC community hates hardware. Learned that one the hard way. But anyways, what I watched is all eight of those students when they graduated bolted. Five went to the US, a couple ended up in Toronto, and then the remaining one went home. So we trained nine people and they all evaporated from Alberta. And that's the Canadian story. We're, if I use the hockey analogy, we're the farm team. We develop great talent and we're one of the most educated countries in the world. And that talent evaporates and goes to other places that are more risk tolerant. So I really do worry about Canadian firms. Yeah, I would only say that, I mean, I, I thought with the fact with uh, this uh, movement to AI and the fact it no longer needed necessarily all the heft that some of the previous Silicon Valley things was that we'd have a more distributed world of digital innovation. And in fact, I think it may be going the other way to uh, the point that you just made. Yeah. Uh. There's a comment in the chat from Sylvia about notifying or noting uh, Hootsuite and Slack. Well, Slack is, uh, is Rod's story because they got bought by our friends at uh, Salesforce, my former home for a bit. Hootsuite is on its like 17th pivot. It's a, I believe Hootsuite, and this is recorded, is a non-company. Yeah, I agree with you. Runs on tax. The found, yeah, and the founders have left. And that tells you everything. When the founders leave, and especially because they didn't get acquired, that tells you everything right there. So Rod, I just got a, a buzz on my, my WhatsApp. And uh, and uh, it told me to look at my X account. I yeah. just got 15 minutes with Elon Musk for you and I. Cool. So we're briefing him. What's the setup? We get to talk to him. He's neither a, hill, a, a hero nor a villain or he's both. We have 15 minutes. What do we say to him? And what do we ask? Sure. So I want to, my question for Elon is I want to connect some dots. So I read a great article that I have not posted on LinkedIn because I'm a little fearful of the backlash, but I'll put it in this one, is his play in Grok. So that's, Grok is, if you're not familiar, X is, or Twitter is play in generative AI and his neural network. So what this article talked about, it was a bit of a future play, but it was basically around some of the stuff that I heard in the futurist session before this one is, is Elon pushing towards a world where he is just going to have a bunch of robots as workers. So I heard about the chip in the futurist conversation. He's building that chip. He's also now building Grok, which is a generative AI engine trained on Twitter. He's got some of the components in 2023 to get us to some of those futurist things that we've spoken about. So my question to him is, what's his long view? Where's he going? I thought he was going to Mars. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing. <laughs> but that would be my play. But I welcome your thought. What would you want to talk to him about? Uh, I, I would uh, say what's the consolidation? So it's a it's a really uh so in putting together robots, cars, like to your oh and and here's this uh, as I think about it, your framework should be applied against Tesla trillion dollar not Tesla but Musk Inc. And what is the company becoming? Because there are things there that are related, but he doesn't talk about very much. Robots, yep. cars, trucks. Um, yep. and this Can brain, we... right? This brain that's kind of a broken because Twitter's kind of a brain of this instant fast response. If there's black smoke in the sky, you still look at Twitter and you literally Twitter, not X. And yep. uh, in the last this uh, the shift away from X, uh, I believe, uh, was consolidated around the open AI non story because there's real time things going on and people couldn't find information that wasn't that was. I don't know enough signal that it uh, it's broken. I don't know if we can fix it, but it's still a big signal. Yeah, agreed. Small less. So there's a comment in there about works. We did look at WeWorks. The original business model followed our model perfectly. WeWork, unfortunately, got themselves locked into huge brick and mortar leases that have ultimately gotten rid of their agility. That was their problem that I see. And then they've had a bunch of leadership changes. The, the original start was literally followed our model. But since then, one of the things I didn't talk about, but this raises a good point, is many of these companies that came in and disrupted industries, they lost their innovation edge. And then they've now become part of the wallpaper of the industry. They came in, they changed the industry, but now they are the industry. And new incumbents are waiting to come in. Arthur C. Clarke uh, said that uh, where's the effect of sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from mag magic. From your purview and your catbird seat, what is the technology that is magic right now? Not in 10 years, not in five years, but right now. What What's magic to you, Rod? Frozen. Oh, come back. back. Uh, what's magic to me? Magic is the natural language processing AI technology. And you and I have debated this on LinkedIn. We mm -hmm. haven't seen it officially yet, mm -hmm. but I do think generative AI is going to be our future interface with computers. So we've had Siri, we've had Alexa. So that sort of started us down the path of speech to text. But with the generative AI models, it is going to fundamentally change everything in terms of human computer interaction. I already talked about that book of Gartner, when machines talk to machines. That is the tech. It, it pieces together all of this research that has happened over decades. Actually, it's one of the things I forgot to talk about. When we looked for co-authors of the book, so remember, we started in 2014. We deliberately left AI out of our book. And the reason for it at the time, AI was, it was still based in the research lab at universities. It had not broken out with the exception of IBM, had a little bit of Watson, but Watson was all marketing and not uh, a true thing. We left AI out and literally the book came out that week in my blog sphere, it was all these AI articles. I'm like, oh, we missed that. But to mm -hmm. me, that one tech to me is generative AI. Yeah. It connects so much stuff. I've started switching, uh... When people say graphical user interface, I've started switching them to language user interface. Yeah, I agree. Louis, away from the GUI. Now we've got another question in the chat. Denise, our partner in crime. When you were asking about verticals to explore, affordable automation and AI with real value propositions for producers in agriculture. Agriculture thoughts? So, well, there's a hard problem that uh, in a low margin business and yet yeah. multi-billion dollar business. So I'm gonna, I'll put on my board hat again at Albert Innovate. So we fund a lot of uh, ag tech and you just touched on it, Rob. There's the problem in agriculture. It is a an industry that needs a lot of tech to help with the solutions, but there's a lot of big players. There's a lot of little players. So the family farm, and then there's the 
equipment manufacturers. So think uh, John Deere. The problem is little players can't afford this stuff. And so to build the tech at scale, it doesn't, it doesn't work. You have to go sell to a thousand farmers to make a profit. Big tech, they want to, or the big farms, they want to build their own stuff. And then the other thing that's also happening is John Deere is building their own tech. So if you're not aware, John Deere tractors, which is one of the global leaders around uh, farm equipment, every tractor is equipped with a GPS and it automatically sends the data back to John Deere. And John Deere, I read about this a while ago and I was actually thinking about applying to John Deere because of this. They stream all of that data and then in the cockpit of the tractor, you can subscribe to a software as a service model that'll tell you things that you should be doing as a farmer. Stop fertilizing here, fertilizer there, and in real time, you're getting analytics advice from John Deere. That's where they're headed. So that's the sort of ecosystem of ag tech. It's a tough space from what everything I've observed. I heard they're also closing their equipment. You can't change their equipment. Same yep. model, it's all set piece. And now uh, Denise has another good point. Denise, can you talk or I don't want, I can jump in. She mentioned a really good idea. Or, or, go ahead. Can you talk? I didn't want to interrupt because you guys had such a good flow, but I um, totally agree, Rod, with everything you're saying. I think we could absolutely have a side conversation, you and I. There's lots of neat stuff happening at Olds College and our firm, Raven Bay, um, not to promote us, but we do work with, um, with, some of the big tech companies and large agriculture. We work with Bayer. And it so happens that my husband is a fourth generation farmer. So I kind of a double agent. Oh, okay. So we could have a great <laughs> conversation. But I think there's a spot for um, um, data science and data collection around carbon capture because there's so much sensor data that if yep. we could. And, and new, new crop. We're fortunate, yeah, we're fortunate here in Alberta, we have a semi functioning carbon credit. Um, market. So maybe we can have a discussion around that. I really think if we can help farmers get a uh, new revenue stream independent of yield, it could be really interesting for them. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Reach out through LinkedIn. Happy to chat. Okay. No, thanks. Sorry. I could have, uh, yeah, I don't know what more. I don't want to bore everybody with our, yeah. with my um, egg nerding, but yeah, I think there's something there. There's the something last... carbon oh, capture that could help multiple people. The last cool tech and is all mixed in drone AI swarm was fruit picking. And uh, <laughs> there's one, uh, my own, my question is like, oh my goodness, you could do that. Just fly around and like, and in, it, it has such implication, right? Of good and bad. Like, okay, well, what are all the crop workers going to do? And every time someone says, what are all the crop workers going to do? I grew up on a farm, Rod. Okay. Right. And I know that if I could have invented a robot that could shovel shit, build a fence, or <laughs> pluck, especially strawberries. Strawberries at scale, because it's at the end of the summer, is not a fun thing to do, period. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, what confuses me, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not good, uh, a good analyst of that, is I'm not a good analyst in low margin businesses. It really is the hardest thing in the world to uh, run yeah. around and make a percent or two percent. Uh, That's so where bankers do it really, really well at their scale. Okay, uh, so thank you so much, Rod, for your yeah, no looking, problem. Thanks for the looking opportunity. to the past to build to the future. That's solid work. Looking forward to the next productions that you do. We'd love to be involved and keep us in mind as we pull you into the guild as one of our producers. But thanks again. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And if anybody wants to geek out, as I saw on the chat, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. Great stuff, Rod. Thanks very much. We're going to uh, pause and then get going again. Uh, here.